Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video I'm going to talk about adenosine triphosphate, otherwise known as ATP. ATP is usually shown with this yellow starburst behind it, and that's because it contains energy. In fact, it's the energy coinage of all life on our planet. And most of you probably know that, but you might not know the structure of ATP. And so let's begin with the adenine. Adenine is a purine, and it's a nitrogenous base. That means that the black is going to be carbon, but the blue is going to be nitrogen. Where have we seen nitrogenous bases? Remember, that's going to be the rungs found on the inside of DNA. We also have a ribose sugar, uh, and then we're going to have not one phosphate group. Phosphate is phosphorus surrounded by oxygen, but we're going to have three phosphate groups. And so let's start with the adenine and the ribose. They're attached together and they form a chemical called adenosine. If we add a phosphate to that, we have AMP, or adenosine monophosphate. If we were to add another phosphate to that, we've now got adenosine diphosphate, or ADP. But if we add that third phosphate, we now have ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Now these last phosphates are important. In fact, I like to think of the bond between these last two phosphates like a spring. As we attach that last phosphate on, we're storing energy, and so there's potential energy in that bond. There's also going to be potential energy in this bond right here as well. And so when we release that phosphate, we can release a little bit of energy. And so let's look at that. And so what is ATP? Here it is again. So we've got our adenine, our ribose sugar, and then we have our three phosphates. But you can think of it like a recharged battery. It's a battery that's charged up and has a certain amount of potential energy. In fact, if we were to take ATP, which would just look like salt if you were to have it in a solid form, and we were to add it to water, it would all hydrolyze. In other words, it would all break down into ADP. And so let's look at what's going on here. So if this is water, that water will, will break this last phosphate group. In other words, we're going to add an OH on one side and H on the other side. Remember, we call that hydrolysis or breaking with water, and we create ADP. Now we have just two phosphates here. Well, what happens to that third phosphate? It's released. And so lots of times when you're dealing with uh, ATP, you're going to see this P with a subscript of I. What does that stand for? That's this phosphate group that's been given off. And since there was a certain amount of potential energy in this bond, when it's released, that phosphate has a certain amount of potential energy as well. So in other words, if we were to let ATP just sit in water, it would all eventually hydrolyze and it would all become ADP and we'd have these loose, loose phosphates. Um, that's going to be like a battery that's lost its charge. And so what do we do in life? Well, in life, we're going to tap some energy. And so we could do that in respiration by breaking down glucose or in photosynthesis by taking in energy from the sun. And we're going to attach that phosphate group again. And that's called a dehydration reaction. And so when we attach the phosphate, we now make ATP. When we break it, then we're going to release energy. And so let's start by talking about the building. And so when do we produce ATP? We're going to do that in cellular respiration. And so remember, on the inside of that mitochondria, we have these uh, proteins called ATP synthase. And what happens in all of respiration is we build up a gradient of protons on the outside of that. And as they flow in, we make ATP. Now it's worth pausing for just a moment and talking about, you know, how does ATP know where to go and how does ADP know where to go? Well, if you were to think about it, let's look right here. As we're converting ADP and a phosphate back into ATP, they're disappearing. So you can think of in the mitochondria, that's going to be the lowest amount of ADP and phosphate is going to be found right here. Why is that? It's because they're going to be converted into ATP. Well, where's the ATP going to flow from there? Well, diffusion is going to move it from an area of high concentration to low, and so it's going to move to wherever it's used. Once it's used, it converts back to ADP and a phosphate, and that's going to come right back here to the inside of the mitochondria. Now remember, plants are also going to produce ATP. They're going to do it on the thylakoid membrane, which is going to be this membrane right here on the inside of the chloroplast. What are they using to make ATP? They're using light, energy of light, to do that. Uh, how is this different than the mitochondria? Remember the phosphates, or excuse me, the hydrogen protons are going to be on the inside of the thylakoid membrane. As they flow out, that's going to make ATP. What do we use that for in plants? Remember out here in the Calvin cycle, we're going to use that to make uh, sugars. Now plants also have mitochondria, so they can break down that uh, sugar and make ATP. And so that's how we're producing it. What does it do though? Once we release that phosphate, what is it used for? Well, let me give you three good ways that it's used. So if we release that phosphate, 
It can be used in active transport. And so this right here is the sodium potassium pump. This is going to be found on most of the cells in your body, but it's especially important in the um, neurons of your body because you maintain this gradient, and that's how nerves actually work or impulses work. And so let's watch what's going on. We have ATP right here. It's going to give up that phosphate, and that phosphate is going to bind to this sodium potassium pump. As it does that, it's going to use the energy of that phosphate to pump three sodium ions out. We're then going to have two potassium ions that will bind to the inside of that pump, and that's going to flow to the inside as we release that phosphate. And so again, what are we using? We're using active transport to pump sodium out and potassium in. How much of your energy right now is going to that? About 20% of the energy in your body right now is going to ATP, which is running the sodium potassium pump and keeping all those neurons working. So it's really important. How else do we use ATP? Well, when we release that phosphate, our muscles move using ATP. And so what's going to happen is the phosphate will bind to this myosin. A myosin is going to be a protein, and it'll attract that to an actin, and it's going to cause your muscle to contract. And so your muscles contract using this phosphate that is released from ADP. What do we have to do with that phosphate in ADP? Again, we have to regenerate ATP so that we can do this again. Where else do we have this? Well, in, in the formation of polymers. And so when we're building polymers, the easiest way to do that is to add a phosphate. And so let me kind of show you where we're at. This is tRNA. Remember, tRNA is going to transfer the amino acid to the ribosome, and it's going to build proteins. And so how does that work? First thing is we're going to have ATP, and that's going to bind to, the, to this enzyme. And then it's going to allow us to attach that amino acid onto the tRNA. And so we can build big polymers like that. In fact, RNA is built using ATP. What does that mean? Well, let's get to it. ATP is old school. What does that mean? It's been around from the beginning of time. It was used by LUCA. LUCA, remember, is the last universal common ancestor. In other words, that is the ancestor of all cells on our planet. And so this is a phylogenetic tree of all life on our planet. We would have us, eukaryotes over here, we have archaea, and then all of this is bacteria. But scientists believe that that first ancestor of all life had a few properties. Number one, they used ATP, they had RNA and DNA, um, they used or had the ability to use glucose, they used proteins, ribosomes, membranes, and ion channels. And so let's say that LUCA kind of looked like this. It's a simplified cell. Well, how did scientists come up with this? Why is it that this cell had to have all those things? Well, that's because those things are found in all cells on our planet. Not only us, but it's going to be found in prokaryotic cells and archaea. So we know that that first organism had that and used ATP for its energy, and that's because it's found in all cells. And so ATP has been there from the beginning, but let's look at how prevalent ATP is in these other molecules. And so let's look at RNA. So what's RNA? Remember, it's going to be kind of the worker of DNA. But let's look right here into one of these nucleotides inside RNA. What do we find? Well, we find adenine, we find a ribose sugar, and then we have a phosphate. Well, what does that look like? That looks like ATP, except only one phosphate in instead of two. And so when I said when we're building RNA, we really are building that using ATP. And you can see how cool that is, that the ATP, the energy that we used, for, or the molecule that you use for energy was also a part of that first genetic code. And so it was kind of co-opted for two uses. Let's look at DNA. DNA also has this adenine. It has a deoxy uh, sugar, and there's an enzyme that's actually going to switch that. Um, but it's also really close in, in um, structure to ATP. All cells use glucose. What do we use glucose to do? Remember, we're going to break down glucose in the mitochondria, and we're going to make ATP. All life is built of proteins, and ribosomes do that. Well, how do we do that? Remember, it's going to be ATP that's binding those amino acids onto the tRNA so that we can build them inside the ribosome. And remember, all cells are also going to have membranes and use ion channels. Well, if you look at it, that ion channel, like that sodium potassium pump, uses ATP. And if you were to look even in the phospholipids that make up the membrane, what do we find right here in the middle? We find that phosphate group. And so ATP has been around forever. It's used by all of life. It's pretty simple. Just add a little bit of energy to ADP. And you've got ATP. If you release that energy, give off a phosphate, you can do work. Um, so that's ATP, and I hope that was helpful.